a little more casual because I do not want to come across on Wednesday night, you know, like I'm uh, preaching at you. I want folks to feel like they're in on a conversation, you know. So anyway, so we put some comfortable chairs in here, push the pulpit aside, and this is how we're going to do Wednesday night. This will assure that you get a much better quality picture, you'll get much better quality sound, and uh, everything we do in the name of the Lord, I like to do uh, with the best possible quality. Quality is something Tommy will tell you, it's very important to me. I, I like everything to be the best we can do. Honestly, if we had the money, I would have a much, 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 much better video camera that we would be taping our services with. Uh, there are cameras out there that used, they run two to three thousand dollars and knew they, they cost twice that amount or three times that amount, but they produce a television quality, you know, like you're watching television. So uh, I'd love to have that, but that's a lot of money. So we, we do with what we've got. We are taping our Wednesday nights from here on out so that we can uh, put them on our, our YouTube and share them with folks on an ongoing basis. And hopefully uh, it'll benefit people, you know, beyond simply tonight. All right. So we want to begin our discussion tonight with a word of prayer. If we'll bow our heads a moment. Yeah, i got to keep this one in line, folks. If we'll bow our heads a moment. Father, we love you so much. And God, I am so grateful for the strength and the help and the health that you've allowed me to have in recent days so that I can work on projects that I've been desiring to work on for so long. And Master, we're grateful today, God, for all that you do for us. And we're grateful more than anything for salvation, for a knowledge of the truth of God that's able to set men free, for the relationship that you've offered us through the person and the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, today my faith is real. And I ask God today that you would make yourself present in this place. You promise in your word, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And we claim that promise today. We believe that promise, God. And Master, I ask God that you would allow your presence and your power, even in a more informal setting, to be very real, allow our discussion tonight, the teaching, uh, to be anointed of the Holy Ghost, that it might benefit all those who watch and listen, those who are watching live right now, those who will be watching later by reason of recording. Master, we ask all this in that precious, wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. I like to be able to acknowledge some of you who are watching. Got quite a few at the moment. Uh, Marissa, let me put on my glasses, honey, so I can say your name correctly. Uh, Anderwald and Christ, Christiane Carosa, Robert Shore Goss, Dean Hyatt, hello, Dean. David Medina Huston. Uh, Natalia Pedraza Limas, we're happy to have you all with us tonight. David uh, Medina Houston, we're glad to have you. Hello. Uh, Rick Stober, and uh, we're grateful for all of your participation. There may be others. Uh, again, sometimes it says this one and this one, and so many others are watching, and it says that right now, but unfortunately it doesn't list your name. But if you have a comment or if you have something to offer to the conversation, we invite you to use the Facebook uh, Messenger and we'll try to monitor it, keep an eye on it, and try to respond to your inquiries, okay? I'm a little self-conscious about sitting here in socks. I don't normally do this, but oh well. 
Uh, I've been able to get out this last few weeks and work on our yard. Tommy and I bought this house, and we thank God for it every day. We love our house, but when we bought it, they had done a complete remodel of everything. I mean, the whole house was practically gutted and started over. We had a brand new kitchen and all the new appliances and brand new bathrooms. You know, it was very nice. The only problem is they hadn't really done anything at all with the landscaping. Apparently, they sunk so much money into the property that they were ready to quit. They didn't want us to put more money into it. They told us they had spent like, what, uh, 80000 or something doing remodels, you know. Uh, it was a lot of money they spent. And so anyway, we told them in order to get a good deal on the house, we said, well, leave the, the landscape and we'll take care of it. Well, the preacher didn't know he was going to wind up finding out after years and years and years that I was a severe diabetic. I didn't know I was going to find out I had a lazy thyroid, uh, <laughs> which in turn made me lazy, not lazy, but made me lethargic. Uh, for years, I struggled with being able to do anything, literally, folks. Uh, I wish you could understand how bad it was. Tommy could tell you. All I could do most of the time was just sleep my life away or, or lay down or sit in a chair. Uh, and it wasn't by choice because by nature I'm a very active person. I love to be active. I love to do stuff. I love to go camping. I love to go fishing. I love to go kayaking. I love to work on the lawn. You know, I love to be active. And I kept telling Tommy, we've been together 17 years plus. Uh, 17 and a half years almost now. And I kept telling them, I said, honestly, honey, I am a much more active person than this. I, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand what's going on. So finally, the doctor figured out the uh, diabetes, and she said, I've got a feeling, based on your numbers and what have you, that you've been diabetic for a very, very long time. And my numbers were through the roof. I was literally up around 700. If anybody knows sugar numbers, you're supposed to be around 100. I was up at like 700. And she said, this would explain a lot of why you're lethargic and, you know, and when your sugar drops, I would virtually go into a coma when my sugar dropped. And for years, I had a problem with my personality literally changing. Literally, my whole person, personality, which are normally I'm lovable, I'm huggable, I'm sweet, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden, and I mean, folks, I'm not kidding. It was like somebody flipping a switch. We could be driving down the road, right, Bobby? And I'd be fine, everything. And then all of a sudden, just literally like this, I would become super, I mean, horribly crabby negative, um, uh, angry, you know, and you know how they talk about being hangry when you, you need mm -hmm. to eat and all that? Well, I finally put it together, and I mean, I suffered this for years, folks, and I finally put it together, and I realized, well, if I eat, that usually picks me back up, and I'm, you know, I'm okay. So I did that for years, but I told my doctor years ago, I said, I think I may be diabetic. It runs in my family. My great-grandfather lost two legs to diabetes. That's how severe he had it. My grandmother was diabetic. Uh, I've got many, several members of my family who are diabetic. I constantly have to drink something. I'm constantly using the restroom not to be, you know, personal, but it's a fact. And long story short, the doctor I had just wouldn't even do anything. It annoyed me. I kept telling Tommy, I said, this guy's driving me nuts. But I'm on Medicare, and it's very difficult to find doctors who accept Medicare. So I was kind of stuck with him, you know. And so finally, he left, and a new doctor came in. And the new doctor, my first visit with her, I told her, I said, I've been telling the other doctor, I think I may be diabetic. I need to get this checked. So, 
she said, okay, well, let's do this certain test first. She said, it doesn't tell us for sure if you're diabetic, she said, but depending on how it comes back, it's an indication that you may be diabetic. So they did the blood work. She called me and she said, Charles, I need you to come right in. We've got to do a, a blood glucose uh, test on you. She said, that test came back really bad. And if you're not diabetic, she said, I'll pay you a million dollars because something's going on with you. So I went back. I did the blood glucose test. And those of you who have ever done it, they do blood work to get like a base reading or whatever, and then they give you this liquid, it's like sugar water, it's very syrupy and sweet to drink, and you got to drink a certain amount of it, you know. Well, I drank this stuff, and literally, I'm not kidding, I almost fell over on the floor and passed out when that sugar hit my system. And I had to sit down, and I'm just like, and, and my head was swimming, and I was just, oh, my goodness. Well, long story short, she said my number was like 700-something. And she said, uh, I've got a feeling you've been diabetic for many, many years. And so she started me uh, immediately on some oral medication and uh, insulin needles. And long story short, uh, it's been, what has it been now, about two years maybe, and uh, I just today got my most recent, uh, what do they call, A1C or something like that, mm -hmm. and I'm down at 5.7, and that actually happens to be the lowest that I've ever been, and below uh, 6 or whatever is where they want you to be, so I'm actually extremely good on the A1C. I had saw my doctor yesterday, and she said, my God, uh, you are doing fantastic. She said, your cancer number is almost uh, invisible. I'm literally down to below uh, one. Uh, again, for those of you that understand the medical jargon, you know, uh, my cancer number is below one. And the doctor, the uh, oncologist, called me, and he was very happy. He was very happy. And he called me and told me, he said, man, you're on the right track. We got everything going good. Uh, my diabetes is pretty much under control. Uh, I still go through periods where when my sugar gets to a certain level, I kind of go through a mini version of the bad mood and stuff. But thank God, for the most part, it's nothing like it used to be. So now my booby loves me again. Because for a long time there, I'm, I'm not kidding, folks. For a long time, even I would have left me. So I give him a lot of credit because I was struggling. And I kept telling him, you know, I'd say, honestly, I don't understand what's happening. And it was a struggle. I actually thought about leaving ministry because of it. Because I felt like I was being a hypocrite. You know, I felt like I wasn't living what I preach. And yet, at the same time, I knew that what was happening to me had to be, had to be chemical. You know, it was not, uh, it had to be biological. It, it just was not who I am. So anyway, so I thank God that I'm feeling so much better and things are going much better. My thyroid's under control. You know, folks, as you get older, these are things you have to wrestle with. Uh, most of the things, except for the leukemia, most of the things that I'm dealing with are hereditary. Unfortunately, I come from a family that has longevity in it, uh, but they've always struggled with thyroid, and I've had my, uh, uh, what did I have removed? Gallbladder. gallbladder. I had my gallbladder removed. My grandmother told me when I was in my 20s, she said, when you get a little bit older, said, don't be surprised if they have to come in and take your gallbladder out. She said, that runs in your grandfather's family. She said, every man in the family has had to have their gallbladder taken out. Well, lo and behold, it happened to me. Uh, I've been through cataracts, you know. This is just part of getting older. You know, a lot of people pray and ask God constantly to heal them of this and heal them of that and heal them of this and heal them of that. And I believe God's a healer. I absolutely believe God's a healer. And there are some things I'm waiting on Him to heal me from. 
because I really would rather not have to wrestle with leukemia the rest of my life, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind him touching the diabetes either. I don't really want to, and I, if he can help me lose the weight so I can get the diabetes under control, I'll be happy with that, and I'm on track for that too. Uh, weighed myself yesterday in the bathroom. I'm down to 240. Yay! Some of you say, 240, that's a horse. Well, it is. But uh, I started out at 265. So 240 is 25 pounds lighter. I need to get down to about 180 or 185, somewhere in that neighborhood. So I got a ways to go. I've still got, you know, 50 or 60 pounds. That's a lot of weight to lose. Uh, but anyway, I like to start our, our discussion with some personal stuff, you know, and not just hit it mm -hmm. right off the starting line with uh, biblical subject matter. Anyway, uh, I've been, you know, I'm always thoughtful about what we should talk about and what we should discuss. By the way, folks, this is Ginger. She's one of our three angels, our little babies. Tommy and I love our dogs. Uh, I've always been thoughtful and prayerful about what we should discuss on Wednesday night. And tonight I felt led that it would be a good idea for us to talk about uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If there is any subject that uh, even in the Pentecostal church, now Tommy wasn't raised in Pentecost like I was. I was born and raised in the Pentecostal church. And over the years that I've been in ministry and I've been studying the Word of God, uh, it's become abundantly clear to me that there is some common thought and teaching concerning the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that, to be honest with you, she wants to come to Daddy. To be honest with you, is inaccurate. And uh, it's, you know, just because something kind of gains popularity and it becomes the standard thought, that does not make it so, folks. And uh, so... It's important that we put our confidence in the Word of God and not merely in traditional thought and traditional position. She's trying to get a good, comfortable position here. And uh, I'll give you an example. One of the most common misconceptions about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, we all understand that Within Pentecostal doctrine, with the Holy Ghost baptism comes the experience of speaking with other tongues, or it's often referred to as speaking in tongues. Now, a lot of people get really tied up on the idea of speaking in tongues. Uh, it makes them afraid, you know, they feel like something takes them over, or something comes out of them that does not originate in them. And there are all kinds of thought processes that go on concerning speaking with other tongues as you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you look at the book of Acts, it is consistent over and over and over again. Every time the gospel was preached to various groups of people, uh, when they received the gift of the Holy Ghost, they began to speak with other tongues. Now, that term sounds all mystical and magical, but it's actually very simple. All that means is they began to speak in other languages. In other words, they began to speak in a language that they did not cognitively know. So therefore... They were speaking, they were speaking, you were speaking when you received the Holy Ghost. There's not something speaking through you, there is not something speaking from another source. It is you speaking. But what happens is, when God fills you with the Holy Ghost, He literally turns on a mechanism, if I can use this analogy, he turns on a mechanism within your spirit that allows you 
to speak in another language and a language that you have no knowledge of in the natural. Uh, and why does God do this? Because this is the physical evidence. See, a lot of people teach, preach, and believe that everything we do with God is without evidence. There's no evidence whatsoever. We just believe. We just, all you got to do is believe. Just believe it, believe it, believe it. But when you experience God, when you experience the infilling of the Holy Ghost, you actually experience evidence. Therefore, God makes himself abundantly real to us when we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And as part of our born-again experience, when a child is born, one of the easiest, simplest, uh, immediate ways to know that that child is healthy and well is when you hear it cry out. That is the uh, spiritual equivalent to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost comes in, it's like a born-again believer taking his first breath, and you let out, you begin to voice. And what happens is, it is not your intellect that is speaking, it is not your thinking, it is not your thought process, but it is literally your spirit, your spirit. It is not the Holy Ghost speaking through you. This again, I was born and raised in Pentecost. This is a common thought process. A lot of, especially older people in the movement, they have this notion that it's the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God is speaking through you. That the Spirit of the Lord, in a sense, is using your voice, you know, but that the Spirit of the Lord is speaking through you. That's not what the Bible speaks, uh, excuse me, teaches. Uh, the Bible tells us that, first of all, Paul talked about speaking in tongues and prophesying in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And he, he states the fact, first of all, that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Now listen to that phrase. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And what Paul was saying was, you do not have to just give a message in tongues because you feel inspired at that moment to do so by the Spirit of God. In other words, the Spirit of God nudges you and says, I want you to speak right now. I want you to speak from your spirit. I'm going to uh, inspire something in your spirit, and I want you to speak it. And uh, I've experienced this. Many Pentecostal people have experienced this, where you give a message in the church in another language. And... Uh, but when you feel that unction, when you feel that urging, it doesn't just all of a sudden go blah, 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 out of you. No, you have control. You can choose when to begin, when to release it, and when not to. If the Spirit of the Lord gives an individual a prophetic word, they have control. That's why there is not total chaos, at least there ought not to be, in a Pentecostal church that has proper teaching. In a Pentecostal church that has proper teaching, and I've talked about this in our church many times, uh, when a message in tongues comes forth, immediately the congregation goes silent. The people in the congregation go quiet. If there's a message in tongues or a prophecy that's coming forth, the church goes silent. That is a discipline. That is something that the people in the church know to do. If you have a message in tongues, if the Holy Ghost is inspiring you to give a message in the Spirit, uh, you don't have to simply, you know, start oh, letting it out when there may be other things happening and, and it would just be confusion and chaos. But what God will literally do, and this is what I mean about People don't understand how real God is. The Lord will literally cause a lull to happen in the service. I've seen this happen I don't know how many times 
all of a sudden there'll be this quiet, just all, that, all you need is a window of a few seconds. And it's all of a sudden there'll be this lull. And that sometimes that includes the preacher preaching. And all of a sudden he'll kind of stop. He'll finish a thought or whatever. And then he'll kind of stop for a minute. And then a message will come forth in tongues. Or a prophecy will come forth. That's proper. That's the way it should be done. Because that way you don't have someone giving a message over the preacher trying to preach. Or over people trying to worship and people trying, you know, to uh, do whatever it is they're doing. The church of God is not about chaos. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians, let all things be done decently and in order. So the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Well, what's important about that phrase is, you don't control the Holy Ghost. Doesn't say the Spirit of God is subject to the prophet. It says the Spirit of who? Of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Uh, the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Now, unknown does not mean that the language that your spirit is speaking in is necessarily a language that is not known somewhere on the earth. It simply means it is unknown to the audience. It is unknown to those or to the one who is speaking, okay? For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, however, or howbeit, in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Now see, Paul, what Paul is doing here for the Corinthian church, he's trying to help them draw a contrast between prophecy and speaking with another tongue. Uh, the people at the church in Corinth got a little happy about the speaking in tongues bit. And a lot of your charismatic churches in the modern world literally followed suit. And they became modern day Corinthian churches. Everything was speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues. Oh, it's such a wonderful, and it is a wonderful thing. God turns this on. He literally brings life into your spiritual man. So now when you begin to pray and you begin to worship and you get a little bit deeper into yourself, all of a sudden your spirit begins to speak. Your spirit begins to sing. Your spirit begins to magnify God rather than your intellect, your thinking, your flesh. And it is the intention or the purpose of worship, that we literally get to that place where we're worshiping God in spirit. Because the Bible said God seeks those to worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is not blessed by, nor is He uh, grateful for, worship that is merely intellectual and physical. Just words, you know, you sing a song, you say things. God wants your worship to originate in your spirit. This is why he breathes life into our spirit when he gives us the Holy Ghost so that now we can worship him. The way I like to, to put it is a direct line. God is the spirit. Jesus said, God is the spirit. They that worship him must worship him. They didn't say should. Must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, God is the spirit. If you're going to worship God as the spirit, you need to worship him from a spiritual place. Do you follow what I'm saying? And that doesn't mean that when you get in the spirit and worship that you're always speaking in tongues. That's not what it means. But it means that, again, you're getting beyond the physical, you're getting, you're getting beyond the natural, you're getting beyond the uh, psychological and the cognitive, 
and you're getting into that deeper place. This is one reason why in worship and in prayer we close our eyes. Why do we close our eyes when we, why don't we just pray with our eyes wide open? Because we're trying to get into a spiritual place. You know, we're trying, I need to, I need to shut out everybody around me. I need to shut out everything around me. And I need to talk to the Lord. And the only person that I want to be focused on, the only person I want to be in communication with at that moment and you say, well, why would you shut your eyes if God's the only person you want to be in communication with? Because there's such a thing as body language. We communicate through more than simply words. So if I'm praying and my eyes are open, someone in the congregation can wink at me. Someone in the congregation can smile at me. Someone in the congregation can, and, and I've got some church members who like to do this while I'm preaching. They're not comfortable saying amen and whatever out loud because they don't come from Pentecostal background. So what they'll do is they'll kind of voice, they'll uh, lip the words that they, you know, they'll say, you know, and they'll kind of do that. Well, when you're praying, you don't want any of that kind of distraction. Do you follow what I'm saying? You want to get into a spiritual place. So you close your eyes, and this is why we close our eyes when we pray. Uh, but when you worship, you want to do the same thing. A lot of our time in worship, if you notice, if you watch the pastor, I close my eyes during the worship. I'm not always staring at people. I'm not all, I look away from the people. I'll look upward, right? Uh, that is all part of getting out of the flesh, getting out of your immediate environment. One of the things that hinders people from receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost a lot of times, they cannot disconnect from everything that's going on around them. They're, they're so focused on, like if, if you're in a much larger church than ours and you're in the altar praying and there's, you know, 40 or 50 people up there praying, uh, they're distracted by this one, that one, you know, all, all the activity going on around them. And of course, uh, some of you that may come from Pentecostal background or have had experience with Pentecostal spirit-filled churches, you'll know what I'm talking about. You always get that well-meaning sister or brother who comes along and they think one of the ways to help you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost is, you know, oh, brother, speak it, speak it. I've, had, I've seen people do this, folks. I've seen, go ahead, glory to God, hallelujah. It's like, what in the world are you doing? What in the name of the Lord are you doing? Uh, you do not need to help God. God can help himself, okay? Uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is about the infilling, the God putting his spirit into you, but listen carefully. But putting his spirit into you at such a level that it doesn't merely fill the vessel, but that the vessel overflows. Baptism, the word baptism in the Greek literally means to immerse or to cover, to bury. So you are baptized, you are immersed in the Holy Ghost. But rather than you're being dipped into the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost comes in and literally just pours out from you until you are just flooded by the presence of God. When this happens, as I've said, God breathes life into your spirit. Your spiritual man will begin to speak. And what scares people sometimes is when they experience it, when they feel the Spirit of God all over them, and they're feeling the power of God, and, they're, and God is making himself so real to them at that moment, and then all of a sudden, they're, they're feeling something coming out of their mouth they don't recognize. And many people literally will fight that. They'll resist that, because it's foreign to them. You know, they don't know what's happening. They don't understand it. And sometimes people will get to a place where they're, they're kind of wrestling with what their spirit is trying to do versus what their, their cognitive mind is telling them to do. 
and they'll literally wind up kind of like this, you know, because they're, it's like they're trying to hold back, but they're trying to let go. And the Word of God actually addresses that. The Bible actually talks about that, and that is what is referred to as stammering lips. They have stammering lips. The Bible said, with stammering lips and other tongues will I speak unto this people. So stammering lips is actually, that's part of the process, so to speak. That means you're almost there. <laughs> you're right on the cusp. You just need to let go and let God. You just need to let your spirit express itself. It is you, darling. It is not a demon. It is not the Holy Ghost taking your body over. Uh, again, you know, in Pentecostal circles, we see people shout and dance, you know, and all. And uh, and I hate to say this, Booby, but I'm going to say it. Especially in the black church, there's a habit of saying, Well, the Spirit made me do this, or the Spirit made me do that. Oh, you know, you caught the Spirit. No, you didn't catch the Spirit. What happens in that kind of expression in worship is that your Spirit, has been inspired. Your, your spirit gets so happy or gets so excited or gets so whatever that it feels the need to express itself physically. And so you begin to physically manifest what's going on in your spirit. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. Your spirit lives inside your body. It's part of you. It's not another person. It's not another anything. It is it is part of our trifold human nature, body, soul, and spirit. Uh, if you look at it like those little Russian dolls, you know, they used to stack them one inside the other. The body is not alive without the soul. But the soul is not alive without the spirit. That's why in the book of Genesis, the Bible said God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became a living soul. Okay? The spirit animates the soul. This is why the Bible teaches that we are dead in our trespass and sin. Well, I'm not dead. I'm running around alive. What, what is the Bible telling me that because I'm not a Christian, because I'm not a believer in Jesus Christ, what does it mean I'm dead? You're not physically dead, but you are spiritually dead. Your soul is dead. When God breathes the Holy Ghost into us, he literally is putting life into our soul. This is why uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, uh, believe that they don't believe in the soul. They don't believe in the concept of the soul. And sadly, at some level, and I'm, I'm going to get a lot of people uh, uh, frustrated here, there's a certain amount of rightness to their thinking which is always dangerous with cults and stuff because there's always a certain amount of rightness to some of their thought processes. Because what happens is they say, oh, but the Bible said the soul that sinneth, it will die. The soul that sinneth, it must die. Yes, absolutely. The soul that sins does die. The soul dies. The spirit does not. And so what happens is, the soul, which is our spiritual man, our spiritual framework, if you could imagine, for instance, I like to try to draw an illustration for people, if I could stand up in front of you right now, the Bible said the word of God is quick, it's sharp, it's powerful, uh, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even the bone from the marrow, listen, and the soul from the spirit. The Bible, the word of God, has the ability to separate the soul from the spirit. What did I say about without the spirit? The soul is dead. All right. So, if I could stand here today and I could step over here in spirit and step over here as soul, what would happen is you'd have three manifestations of myself, neither one of them, not a one of them would be alive. Not a one of them would be alive. 
You'd have three manifestations of me. Spirit, body, soul. And not a one of them would be alive. Because for the soul to be alive, it has to be occupied by the spirit. For the spirit to be alive, it has to be, uh, has to occupy, I mean, excuse me, for the body to be alive, it has to be occupied by a living soul. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. All right. Or by a soul, I should say. All right. So, uh, at the judgment, those people who have rebelled against God and who are not obedient to the gospel, <coughs> excuse me, they are going to experience Excuse me. They're going to experience what the Word of God calls the second death. That is when the spirit is removed from the soul. When the spirit is removed from the soul, what happens to the soul? Dies. It dies. It dies. Now, you say, Pastor, I'm not sure of what you're saying. This isn't what I've been taught in church my whole life. I've been taught that souls that disobey God, go to hell. Um, read your Bible. If you look at the story of Jesus descending into hell after his crucifixion while he was in the grave for three days, the Bible said Jesus did not ascend to heaven during those three days. Rather, he descended into hell. And he preached, listen to what the Word of God says, he preached unto the what? Spirits there. Go ahead. Do your homework. Read your Bible. He preached unto the spirit, not the souls. He didn't preach to the souls. No, because the souls were not alive. In order for the, the soul and the body, the soul and the spirit, excuse me, have to be united. The Bible teaches us, for instance, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Does our soul ascend to heaven at that moment? No. Our spirit does. We are spiritually with God at the moment of death. But it is at the resurrection that our body gives way and the soul then is released. And because at the resurrection, God allows our spirit, which has been given life by the Holy Ghost, to be united with our soul, we become a brand new creature. We, what do we become? A living soul. Now, without a body, we're simply a living soul. The scripture refers to that as having a new body. The Bible talks about us having the same body as Jesus Christ had after the resurrection, not, not at the resurrection. He didn't have the new body at the resurrection. If you remember, Mary came to the tomb, and when she finally realized, when it finally dawned on her who Jesus was, she said, Rabbi, and she wanted to touch him, and he said, don't touch me yet. Don't touch me. I've not yet ascended unto the Father. He was... Not only the sacrifice, but he was also the high priest. And as the high priest, the high priest would prepare himself and purify himself to go into the Holy of Holies, and no one could touch him. Because if you did, you, you'd pollute him, okay? You, you know, you would, uh, uh, it's kind of like a doctor going into surgery, you know, I'm sterile, don't touch me, I'm sterile. And the priest had to go into the Holy of Holies, as it were, sterile. Jesus had physically, literally risen from the dead. But he's told her, he said, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended. I haven't yet fulfilled that high priest uh, uh, role in presenting the sacrifice before God, before the Spirit. The physical body had not yet presented the sacrifice, as it were, to the Spirit, okay? And so you have the different manifestations. Uh, let me see. I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here a little bit. you have any thoughts or any questions? That's not part. You never do. That's, <laughs> what, that's what I hate because uh, the preacher's old and I get a brain hiccup 
and I can't remember. Let me see if anybody online is offering anything that... Uh, I haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. Sherry Mills, we're happy to have you with us. Cameron Brown, Cannon Brown, I'm sorry. Ponda Moody, got some more folks with us. Uh, Dawn, is that Safco? Is that a Greek name, Dawn? I'm just curious because I love names. Hey, my cousin Dawn is watching. Hello, Dawn. I love you, kiddo. And Mario uh, Ur Urkia, I guess. Your mom's on Facebook. I mean, on YouTube. Mom's on YouTube. Okay. And Natalie, uh, Natalia, I'm sorry. We're so happy to have you all with us. Uh, if you have any questions, like I say, feel free to post them. We're more than happy to address these. All right, so the point I'm trying to make tonight concerning the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it is the most wonderful experience you'll ever have in your life. You don't know what it feels like to experience your spirit coming to life, your spiritual man, your soul coming to life. You don't know what that feels like until God breathes his breath into your body. Because again, where does your soul live? In your body. Where does your spirit live? In your body. So therefore he has to breathe it into your body because it's part of your trifold nature. Each one is dependent upon the other. He breathes life into your soul. Your spiritual man then is able to express itself independent of your physical man, so to speak, but it, 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 well, I say independent, meaning your spirit is expressing itself and it's not dependent upon the thought processes and the cognitive abilities of your flesh and blood mind. And you're able to pray in the spirit. You're able to sing in the spirit. You're able, we call various things people do, you know, dancing in the spirit and shouting, uh, you know, uh, folks shout and dance and run and all different kind of things. And the reason you see these things happening is not because we Pentecostal people are just a bunch of quacks and nuts and screwballs. If you look at the story in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, the Word of God tells us, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of, each of them. And they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now here's where I think a lot of Pentecostal people uh, they kind of misunderstand the way it's worded, especially in the King James translation. And they say, when you speak in tongues, you know, it's the Holy Ghost giving you the utterance. You know, it's the Holy Ghost, in a sense, uh, speaking through you, you know. That's not at all what that means. It simply means as the Holy Ghost, as the Spirit of God, gives you the ability. So God gives you the ability to speak in another tongue by breathing life into your spiritual man. And therefore, at that moment, he's given you utterance, okay? He's given you the ability to speak in another language. And you may, you may speak in tongues at the moment you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And believe it or not, it is not imperative that you speak in tongues another time in your entire life. It's, it's not an imperative. Uh, that is simply the evidence that you have received the Holy Ghost. Why, why is evidence so important? Well, because unfortunately, we human beings are flesh and blood. And for me to know that you received the Holy Ghost, like I said, the Baptist folk tell us that you get the Holy Ghost when you come down to the altar and shake the preacher's hand, or when you come down and pray, you know, the so-called sinner's prayer. Really? How do you know? Well, you just believe it because that's what the Bible says, and you just believe it. Well, 
we understand, no, that, that's not how it works. Never did Paul walk up to somebody that was converted and say, oh, y'all have got the Holy Ghost. I'm glad to see y'all have got the... No, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So the Holy Ghost is something that is separate from and apart from simply believing and embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can believe and embrace the gospel and not yet have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So when Paul come upon, you know, a certain set of believers said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, we hadn't even heard that there was any such thing as the Holy Ghost. We haven't heard anything about the Holy Ghost. So I'm sure Paul had a discussion with them, something akin to what I'm talking today, and helped them. To, and the Bible said, then the Holy Ghost fell on them. And they all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And guess what happened? They began to speak with other tongues. They began to speak in other languages. This is how Paul then knew they had received the Holy Ghost. The speaking with other tongues is evidence for you, the individual, that you've received the gift of the Holy Ghost. You don't need anybody else in the room to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You don't need anybody else. If you're so shy and quiet and backwards that you'd feel more comfortable receiving the Holy Ghost all by yourself somewhere, that's okay. And when you have experienced the baptism and you begin to speak with other tongues, you will know you've got the Holy Ghost. Uh, it is also evidence for the church. It is also evidence to the other believers in the church. Ah, look, this person just received the Holy Ghost, okay? And uh, so it is what we refer to as the initial physical evidence of that spiritual transaction, which is the infilling, the overflowing infilling of the gift of the Holy Ghost. And uh, it is an incredible thing, folks, because God will never be so real to you in your life ever, as when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then, as you, when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you can, you can continue to walk in and experience the, uh, what many people refer to as a prayer language, which I think, I don't know, uh, I, I, that term doesn't quite fit with me, because it's not about just prayer, you know. We use uh, speaking with other tongues can be used in worship. It can be used in prayer. It can be used as a message for the church. So it's not really a prayer language uh, in my mind. But you can actually uh, have that as an ongoing part of your life. Because what you simply learn to do is you learn how to get past your your carnal, get past your cognitive, and get into your spiritual man. One of the things that helps us to do that, and I mean it's extremely helpful and it, it's extremely important, and this is one of the things that our church uh, locally here in Dallas, we, we've gone up and down in attendance. Sometimes we have near two dozen, then we have three, then we have five, then we have eight, then we have 14. That You know, it's just been up and down for years. It's been so hard for us to maintain. Uh, and part of that is people move out of town and people go to school and people's jobs transfer them. And But then we've also had people just leave for whatever reason. Uh, it has not been everybody leaving for whatever reason. We've had a lot of people we love to death, and they loved us to death, but they want to transferring or going to college or what have you. And when you have a small church to begin with, obviously uh, every person that comes and goes is noticeable. You know, if we had 400 people, we could lose and gain 20 people a week, and we'd never notice it, you know. But when you have just a small church... Uh, you notice every person that comes in and leaves, and you know it, it affects your attendance and what have you. Um, now, what was I starting to say? I, I went and got. I hate when I do that. Oh yeah, one of the things that really helps when it comes to learning to uh, 
get into the spirit in worship, getting into the spirit in prayer, getting into the spirit and, and beginning again to, to allow your spirit to worship, allow your spirit to pray, is when you are with other people who also have uh, the ability to get in the spirit. One of the things that has been extremely difficult for me over the last 15 years is we have had most of the people that have come into our church are not from Pentecostal experience. And so I'm having to teach folks literally from the ground up. Literally, folks, I mean uh, brick by brick, you know. I'm having to teach people from the ground up about the Pentecostal experience and the Pentecostal faith. And uh, I have not been surrounded by people who know how to be in the Spirit, who know how to worship in the Spirit. And for that reason, uh, a lot of times I'm hindered from doing that, from getting into that place. Because uh, if I do that, other people are going to be sitting there like, what? Okay, what's going on? You know, what's happening now? I don't understand. And that wouldn't be appropriate. That would not be appropriate. If we had more people who were able to worship in spirit and pray in the spirit and what have you, then what would happen is uh, there'd be more of us and you would find that, for instance, if you've got six or ten people, and six of those people know how to worship in the Spirit, then we all might get in the Spirit. But what happens at that point is it really becomes kind of a, I, I'm trying to think of how I want to, it becomes kind of a corporate thing. And even if you're not altogether familiar with that and altogether understanding of everything, it literally kind of pulls you in. It's a wonderful thing. It's an incredible thing. Uh, I've told this story before. Years ago, I had my mother had some friends that she worked with this guy and his wife and this man and his sister-in-law, the wife's sister. We became very friendly with them. Their name were John and Debbie, and the sister-in-law's name, Mom would remember. I can't quite remember at the top of my head. Uh, but Debbie and John came from a Russian Orthodox uh, church background. And they were very faithful to the Russian Orthodox Church. And one Easter, they were without a priest. Their priest had died or something. And they had no priest. Well, for Easter, they have this big ritual. You know, they go through and all this. And the priest normally... They bring their baskets of the food that they're going to prepare for Easter. They bring it to the church, and the priest blesses the food. You know, he blesses the baskets. Well, they didn't have a priest to do this. And I was doing my internship in the Church of God uh, in Connecticut. And so being friends and all, they asked me, they said, Would you be willing to come to our church for Easter Sunday? And I've told you before. I believe that uh, as long as people are putting their faith in Jesus Christ and their doctrine includes his death, his literal burial, his literal physical resurrection, they may not understand who God is the way I understand and know who God is. They may not understand a lot of things that I understand. But as long as they're foundation is at least at that level, I will fellowship anybody. I'll, I'll go into your church and I'll fellowship with you because I fully acknowledge you as a believer. Even the Apostle Paul, when he first met uh, Priscilla and Aquila, you've heard of Priscilla and Aquila, the Bible said that he had to take them aside and teach them the way of God more perfectly. The term perfect meaning complete. Or mature. It, it, there, were, there were many things they didn't understand quite right, okay? They were believers, but they didn't understand everything quite right. 
And so uh, you don't have to be in perfect agreement with every point of doctrine, with every point, for you to be part of the family, so to speak. You know, you may be a distant cousin, but you're still part of the family. So anyway, I agreed. I said, okay, I'll, I'll go to your service on Easter. It, I'll never forget, it was a, a late night service, uh, Easter Eve. And then it went through midnight, and then it went into the next morning. Because at midnight, you know, they have the lights come on in the church and they've removed this sarcophagus thing they have, you know, representing Jesus buried. And actually, from a, from a very liturgical, very ritualistic standpoint, it was a very nice thing. I mean, it, I can't, you know, being Pentecostal and, and it, it wasn't... It didn't float my boat. It, it was not altogether the way I know church to be. But uh, it was it was nice. It was inspirational. It was nice. I, but the only problem I had was the incense. They were throwing incense all around the place. And my God, that stuff stunk. And I mean, and I have allergies of the yin-yang, you know. So that kind of drove me up the wall. But aside from the incense, the whole, it was beautiful. And they really celebrated the Lord's resurrection in such a, it was so sweet. They really believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I give those people credit. When they, after they came back into the church, after marching around three times, you know, at midnight, they come back in, the lights are all on, you know, and, uh, and they're celebrating the fact he is risen. And I was moved. I was deeply moved because the people were so sincere and they were so excited. And the priest would say in Russian, he is risen, and they would respond, he is risen indeed. And then he'd say it in English, and they would respond, he is risen. And I mean, they didn't just say, he is risen indeed. They said, he is risen indeed. You know, they were real excited about it. Well, they asked me, they said, you're a minister. And even though you're not Russian Orthodox, we don't have a priest. We, their bishop came in to do the evening service, the, the Easter service, because their priest had died. And they said, would you because he's not going to be able to be here in time and blah, 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 to do the blessing of the baskets. Would you bless our basket? Well, we believe in praying over our food. You know, we believe in blessing our food. So I didn't have a problem with that. I said, yeah, I could do that. So I did that for them, and they were just thrilled to death that I was willing to do that for them. And so then Debbie's sister uh, agreed. I said, would you like to come visit my church sometime? Now, I visited theirs, and she said, yeah, I'll come visit your church. So she came to the church where I was doing my internship. And it was a wonderful little church in Connecticut, uh, Church of God. And the pastor was from the South. He was from the Carolinas. And he really believed in letting the Spirit of the Lord move and, and uh, people worshiping in the Spirit. And we would have some very boisterous wonderful Holy Ghost services, you know, where people would get in the Spirit, we'd shout, we'd dance, we'd run, we'd jump, we would just have church. Well, don't you know she come to church, and of course that happened. We had a wonderful move of the Spirit of God. Now I'm trying to illustrate, you don't even have to understand it, you don't even have to have a grasp of it, right? It kind of pulls you in. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. Jo uh, Debbie's sister, I wish I could remember her name, she was sitting next to All of a sudden, she began to weep. And she literally fell over onto me. Literally. Weeping. And she was just wailing. You could hear her halfway across the church. And I'm thinking, dear Lord, what's, what's happened to her? What's going on with her? Well, after a little while... When I was able to talk to her, I said, are you okay? And she said, I have never experienced anything like this in my life. She said, this is the most beautiful thing. My God, this is the most incredible. She said, I have never. She said, I could not control myself. I literally could not control myself. I was so overtaken with emotion. Now, here's a girl who comes from a church. That is so liturgical and so ritualistic that they make the Roman Catholics look charismatic, okay? And 
Yet, when she was in the presence of the Spirit of God and the power of God, and when God made himself so real because people were worshiping in the Spirit, and the Bible said God occupies the praises of his people, when we worship God as we're supposed to worship God, which is spirit to spirit, not just from your flesh, not just from your thinking, not just cognitively, but we literally wind up drawing the presence of God right down. And uh, I remember Brother Gillum telling me a story years ago about uh, at the old Riverside Church of God in Fort Worth, Texas. He said there were services where they would be worshiping and the Spirit of the Lord begin to move, you know, and things were happening. And he said, and literally, all of a sudden, he said, a cloud, literally a cloud, would descend into the sanctuary. He said it was like fog. And he said, and it had the most beautiful smell. He said, I can't even describe, said it was like perfume. There was this incredible perfume. And he said that, uh, this, this, the whole sanctuary would fill up with like this cloud. And he said, and we would just be worshiping and having church for hours. He said, and then all of a sudden you'd literally see the cloud just begin to rise up through the ceiling and disappear. And people would be healed in the service. People would receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the service. Uh, people would be delivered during those services. Folks, I'm here to tell you today, God is real. When you deal with people who, who want to say, you know, well, there's no proof that God is real. If the church would be what the church is meant to be, if we would do things the way we're supposed to do things, I'm going to tell you something. I've seen people come into church, Pentecostal churches. I remember a lady at the Riverside Church of God. One Sunday, uh, she came in, just never had seen her before, didn't know who she was. She came into our church, she sat through a service, and next thing you know, she's coming to church faithfully. And on Wednesday night, they used to do testimonies, you know. And one Wednesday night, she got up and she said, I've never done this before. He said, I hope you all will be patient with me. He said, I've never done this testimony thing before. She said, but several weeks ago, I started coming here. She said, I'm a lifelong Methodist. He said, I've been in the Methodist church for 50-something years. She was up in age, you know, uh, like probably around 60 or so. She said, I've been in the Methodist church my whole life. She said, and... I attended that Methodist church next door. They had just built this beautiful brand new Methodist church next door to the Riverside Church of God. Beautiful building. She said, well, you know, a few weeks ago, I was coming to church, the Methodist church that I parked in their parking lot. She said, all of a sudden, I felt this voice speak to me. You need to go visit that church over there. She said, so I left my car in the Methodist parking lot. And I walked across the, there was just a little side street between us. She said, I walked across the street and I came into your church. She said, I have never in my life felt God as real and as powerful. And she said, it's just the most incredible thing I've ever experienced in my life. She said, I've never experienced anything like this. And she said, and uh, you got a member for life. I'm here to stay. I've seen that happen over and over my whole life. I've seen that happen because God is real. See, God doesn't need us to prove him. God doesn't need us to defend him. God does not need us to explain him. What God needs us to do is experience him and then to uh, communicate with him and worship him as he desires to be communicated with and worship. Even in the book of Jude, the apostle Jude said, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So he encouraged the people that he was writing to, 
to pray in the Spirit. Why? Because that builds you up. There's, there's, there's a spiritual value, there's a spiritual benefit in praying in the Spirit. And again, if, if you have time, because I'm trying not to make this preachy, I'm trying to kind of keep it semi-conversational. Tommy's grinning at me, so apparently I failed in my efforts. You're fine, you're fine. But if you have time, read the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Because that is where Paul goes into great depths discussing the benefits, the value in praying in the Spirit and worshiping in the Spirit. And he talks about the fact that, uh, that he said, I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with my understanding also. I'll pray with the Spirit and I'll pray with my understanding also. Uh, if you have people who do not fully participate because they're not full of the Holy Ghost and they don't know how to get in the Spirit, then Paul says the last thing in the world you want to do is everything in the Spirit to the point that there's no understanding. Because then you're just going to have somebody sitting there saying, these people are a bunch of nuts. What's going on here? I have no clue what's happening. But if you mix it up, so to speak. And again, this indicates that there's a certain amount of control that you have. He said, I will pray with the Spirit. I'll pray with my understanding also. Well, if praying in the Spirit was the Holy Ghost taking you over and making you do something, well, how in the world are you going to control that? You wouldn't. you wouldn't have any control. So that indicates, again, you're able to yield to your Spirit. You're able to allow your Spirit to speak. You're able to allow, and uh, I remember Brother Carver, who I did my internship under, I remember him one time saying to me years ago, well, I was in my internship program, and I think we were traveling to, uh, I think we were going to a camp meeting together, and he said something to me about it. He said, I know that praying in, the, in tongues, praying in the Spirit is supposed to be as the Spirit gives the utterance. See, he was still of that mindset that like the Holy Ghost has to be the one who's making it all happen at that exact moment. He said, uh, I know that's how, you know, mechanically it works. He said, but it sure doesn't take much for me to, to uh, begin to pray in the Spirit. He said, all I have to do is say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. He said, all of a sudden, I find myself praying in the Spirit. Well, what he didn't understand was, it was simply about, right, it was his Spirit. And it was simply about getting into the Spirit. And so all he had to do was worship the Lord that much, and boom, he was in the Spirit. Well, when you've been in this thing long enough, you literally are able to do that. You learn to be able to get in the Spirit very quickly, very I mean, you can literally get in the Spirit in a matter of seconds because you know how to tune out and turn off everything in the natural and just allow your spirit to begin to pray. You know, sometimes you go up to uh, pray with somebody who's sick, who needs healing, somebody who needs a miracle, and people will come up and they won't say two words in English. They'll immediately be in the Spirit. They'll immediately begin to pray in the Spirit, you know? And it's simply because they've learned and they, they've mastered, as it were, the ability to tune their spirit in and tune out the natural. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It is not to be feared. I hope this discussion has helped people to understand this at a level where uh, you won't be so afraid of the thought of it. Because, you know, growing up as I did and, and hearing so much uh, teaching and talk from other believers, you know, that literally made you feel like God's going to take control. Hallelujah. God is going to just grab your body and, you know, he's going to really grab your tongue and he's going to start making you speak in other tongues and all. And uh, it was it was daunting, you know, hearing that. It was scary. It, it, there was a certain amount of anxiety mm -hmm. that came with that. And so for years now, I've been trying to help uh, teach on this subject matter to help people understand it's really a whole lot simpler. It is really a whole lot less 
uh, anxiety inspiring uh, than you could ever imagine. And I'm going to tell you, with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, oftentimes uh, many wonderful other things come with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I can tell you, you're going to feel the love of God like you've never felt the love of God in your life. You're going to feel joy like you have never felt joy in your life. You're going to feel peace like you've never felt peace in your life. Uh, again, that doesn't mean you're going to feel it from this moment forever because we allow things going on in our lives sometimes to kind of overwhelm. But when you get in the Spirit, you go right back to that place where you feel the peace of God. You feel the joy of God. This is why people shout. This is why people dance. This is why, because they, they may be going through hell on earth in their life. They may be going through divorce. They may be going through cancer. They may be going through the death of a loved one. And all of a sudden, they're dancing all over the church. They're celebrating. They're happy. They're joyful because they've tapped into their spirit. And God has been able to revisit that joy in the Holy Ghost that we have, that peace we have in the Holy Ghost. But you'll experience those things. But also, a lot of times when people receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, they'll be delivered from addictions. Uh, people have been smoking for years. All of a sudden, they, they, they literally just immediately lose any desire to smoke cigarettes again. Uh, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, um, it is amazing, folks. I'm telling you, uh, I'll try to close up our discussion tonight. Uh, I've told this story before, but Teen Challenge is a program that was started in New York City many decades ago by a very famous preacher by the name of David Wilkerson. And David Wilkerson had gone to New York City and he had started a ministry reaching out to gang members. And this is back in the 60s when gangs were really heavy and, you know, a lot of gang warfare and people were being murdered. It was terrible. And he went there. He was an Assembly of God minister. Uh, and he went there and he began to reach out to the gang members and stuff. And many of them were heroin addicts and, you know, just terrible uh, uh, speed and, you know, all that. Back in those days, it was before some of the more modern crack and what have you. <coughs> but anybody who knows anything about heroin knows you want to talk about addiction and, you know. Well, anyway, he opened up a, almost like a community center in the city. And the, the uh, young people could come who were looking for God and looking for help in their lives, you know. And uh, they, he gave them a place to stay and provided them with food and all that. And, of course, spiritual counseling and spiritual help and church services and what have you. Well, Teen Challenge developed an amazing program. And at one point, the government was doing some research and they were contacting different programs around the country that dealt with uh, addiction and breaking free from addiction and all. And uh, they contacted Teen Challenge and they said, is it true? Are we reading these numbers right? According to statistics that we've seen concerning your program, you have like a 95% permanent success rate in helping people out of drug and alcohol addiction. And they said, yes, that's, that's a fact. That's our number. And they said, well, how in the world do you do that? He said, every secular program that we have investigated, they're, we're talking one time around. We're not talking about coming back for, you know, going to rehab, so to speak, eight or ten times. One time around. They said, you know, the average is like, if you're lucky, 10% break free and are staying clean, you know. And they said, how in the world do you do it? And the, the director at Teen Challenge said, well, I'm going to be honest with you. The government's not going to like my answer because it's strictly a spiritual answer. It's not, it's not about a program that we offer. Or how you know. He said, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We believe that when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God will fill you with his spirit. 
He will breathe life into your spiritual man. And when this happens, uh, a lot of times there, God is able to break the chains and break the bonds in people's lives, and they never again feel the urge or the need to go back to these things. Well, of course, you know, what could the government do with that? They, how, how does the secular government employ, you know, they can't. Well, uh, Nikki Cruz is a, one of the most famous uh, graduates of that program, and he is a Spanish-speaking man, uh, Puerto Rican, and he was a gang leader back in the day, and he was part of a gang called the Mamas, and uh, not Mamas, the Mamas, and uh, he's one that experienced that. You know, he received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and bam, it was done, it was broken, it was over. And uh, so I'm here to tell you today, folks, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is available to you. This is one of the things that LGBT people ought to be thrilled to death about. Because your being LGBT does not, for one second, prevent you from receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that should tell you something. Mm -hmm. If God is willing to make himself real and pour himself into you, pour his spirit into you, uh, then that ought to tell you something. And uh, I have seen many, many, many LGBT people receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, one man and his partner came. Uh, I met them at a conference down in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, many years ago, an LGBT affirming Pentecostal conference. And sadly, this man and his partner came from an affirming so-called Pentecostal church. <coughs> and the church that they attended focused more on play in church than, than being and living what they ought to be and live. Now, the one man, brother, uh, uh, I don't want to say his name, but anyway, one man, he grew up uh, in a Pentecostal apostolic home. His father was a Pentecostal, United Pentecostal preacher. His partner grew up Lutheran. And so his partner kind of started coming to this church. And of course, they talked about baptism of the Holy Ghost and, you know, blah, 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 blah. But he noticed that some of the people who come to the church, they carry on in church, you know, shout and yell and holler. And then next thing you know, they were going to the bars and picking somebody up and going out to drink and doing all these things. And it made him believe that what they were calling, you know, spiritual worship and all that wasn't real. It wasn't legitimate. Well, when I went to this conference, I had offered anybody in our church who wanted to go could come with me. Well, don't you know, nobody in New York, I was in New York City at the time, was able, except one man named uh, Brian. He was a young fellow, a black man, and a uh, sweet kid, bless his heart. And nothing, 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 nothing between us, so before anybody goes there. And so Brian came with me to the conference, and one night, the Spirit of the Lord fell on Brian, and that boy started running and jumping and leaping and all over the church. You had to know Brian to know what I'm talking about. He was one of the quietest, shyest, most backwards people you ever met in your life. You could barely get this kid to talk. I've told you before, I, I, I've talked about how people laugh while they're talking, and every virtually every word they say or every sentence they say, they're kind of chuckling because they're so nervous and so, you know, so anxious. Well, that's how Brian was. You know, he talked, he, 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 he's constantly giggling and laughing. He was so unsure of himself and so uncomfortable, you know. All of a sudden, he's shouting all over the church, and you know. And I told this brother who was raised Lutheran, I said, now, I don't know what else you've seen because I don't know those other people. I said, but I'm going to tell you, I know this one. I said, I promise you what's happening here is real. Well, we spent, these two brothers and I spent a good deal of time together during the conference. We went to meals together. We had a wonderful time. They came to New York, spent several days with me in New York, 
and we had the most wonderful fellowship. It was it was so sweet. We had two Sunday church services and had a wonderful time. And they went home. And shortly thereafter, the brother who was raised Pentecostal called me on the phone. He was so excited. He said, Brother, guess what? I said, What? He said, Wade received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He got the Holy Ghost. He said, And I want to thank you. He said, You really helped to make that possible. Because he was seeing so much of this stuff that was disingenuous and, you know, uh, and he said, but you were so real and you are so real and your experience is real and you don't play games. He said it really spoke to him and it helped him to open up and say, okay, Lord, if this thing is real, then give it to me. And by God, God gave it to him. So he got the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave him the utterance. All right, young people, that is all for tonight. We've, uh, we're almost at the 9 o'clock hour, or pretty close, or somewhere around there. And uh, I'm so grateful for those of you that watch. I hope that this has been helpful to you. And uh, whether you're home alone, or whether you're washing the dishes, uh, if you work, you know, uh, by yourself on a machine in a factory, honestly, let God make himself real to you. Ask him, Lord, I need your spirit in my life. I need you to fill me to overflowing. And don't be afraid if you feel the deepest part of your inward man beginning to express itself. Uh, don't be afraid to let it happen. Just let it happen. Everything that comes out of your spirit is going to be magnifying God, praising God, giving him worship and glory. And uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's, it's just God breathing life into your spiritual man. Let's just close with a word of prayer once again. Father, we thank you, God, tonight for this opportunity, Lord, to share with our friends and to come together and to talk about the wonderful things of God. Lord, I thank you every day for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I'm so glad that I grew up in a church that taught this and believed in this and accepted this because the circumstances in my growing up were so difficult and were so troublesome and, and hard to struggle with. And Lord, it was the presence of your great Holy Ghost in my life that kept me sane and sound and oftentimes prevented me, Lord, I'm sure, from falling into suicidal depression. And Master, today in the name of Jesus, I lift up individuals under the sound of my voice, Lord. There are people who are seeking something more. They need God to feel you, to know you, to experience you. And Master, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray. Mm -hmm.